Hello, I'm Ari. And I'm Claudine. Welcome to Proving the Negative. We're a podcast all about exploring the different sides of cybersecurity, from political science to computer science, international relations to mathematics. Join us as we talk to our friends about the work they do. My name is Dr. Mary Bispham. My doctoral project was about the security of speech interfaces and voice control. My website says that I'm a cybersecurity researcher and an innovator. Being an innovator is something that I'm aspiring to at present. I'm keen to deepen my understanding and in the future to use that to create an innovation. Not quite sure what that will be, but something that will be of of genuine value to people and, and genuine use in contributing to the field. What are you curious about? More broadly, is this technical understanding of detail that I find just fascinating. The technical detail of how things become vulnerable, how how it works in practice, specific bugs in specific systems, and really getting below generic descriptions of that and the news headlines to really understanding how that how that works in practice. That's something that well I've certainly scratched the surface of and continue to learn about. I didn't start from a technical background, but I've tried to gain as much technical understanding as I can during my doctorate on an ongoing basis. And I found that really rewarding, especially when, when I do feel that I've fully understood something and I know how it works. That really motivates me. I'm curious, you said you don't come from a technical background. How did you become interested in attacks on speech interfaces? A very specific area to, to stumble into. Well, I, I came from a very varied background and I came into cybersecurity as a second career. So I'd accumulated a fairly mixed bag of knowledge, some of it useful. I actually started out in humanities learning Latin, which I really enjoyed at the time. It was that that detailed how the language works, how the grammar works. I'd always wanted to follow that up in some way. I'd carried on studying in my own time, uh, different subjects. When I got the opportunity to do the full-time doctorate, I was looking for an area that I could use as much of my prior knowledge as possible. Language technology and speech, even though at the time I didn't know much about it, seemed to fit that bill. As I looked into it more, it became more and more of an issue as people started to use Alexa and Google more widely. I feel I was quite lucky as well in that it coincided with a more general trend. I didn't know that at the time, a stroke of luck and fitted my previous interests. Which general trend was that at the time? When I started looking at this in 2015, it was still fairly unusual for people to be using Alexa and and Google and voice on their phone and things like that. And my impression is that that's become far more widespread since more of an ordinary thing, perhaps less so amongst security researchers who have concerns about Alexa listening in on their conversations, which was kind of why I pursued this research. Certainly looking at my family, my friends, they all seem to now, as a matter of course, be using Alexa in a way that they weren't five years ago. That's not something that I can claim to have foreseen, but it's been quite lucky for me. When I started the research, I wondered if it was too niche, possibly something that would go out of fashion within a couple of years. And that doesn't seem so far to have happened. So that's encouraging. Are we looking at voice hacking here? That sounds quite cool, doesn't it? Very sci-fi. Well, yes, in the sense that hacking is it's trying to get a system to behave in a way that its developers didn't intend. And that's what I've tried to do with voice control is provide speech or audio input to devices that will provoke it to do something that it shouldn't do according to the developer's specifications. Yes, you could describe that as voice hacking. I say it's um, perhaps a little bit in the realms of science fiction for the moment. You're also a penetration tester. We talked about general headline cybersecurity, but also the, these technical details. And you said you're interested in these details. What is pen testing? And What interests you about it? I did an internship with a penetration testing company during my doctorate. What it essentially consists of is pretending to be the person who's trying to attack a company, but actually your intentions are good rather than bad. You preempt an attacker by attacking their potential victims yourself without intending them any actual harm and therefore give them a chance to prepare for someone who might actually be doing that for real. I have to say it was from having been in academia and considering quite theoretical and abstract topics to the real world of real vulnerabilities and real management of large systems in the public sector and in in industry. There is quite a contrast. It was quite a valuable experience to be aware of it. 
you also learn that really you might you might solve something on an academic level in your own mind as a theoretical problem, but implementing that in reality in, in society is always going to be a very different, very, very different thing. Some awareness of that as an academic is good. How did your academic experience inform your professional experience and, and vice versa? Oh, that's an interesting question. They are different worlds. That is as it should be. There's a place for industry where you're not looking for the perfect solution that will be valid forever. You're looking for something that will be of actual practical use in a given time and place. And that's fine. Everything is done under time pressure. You don't always have time to do things perfectly. Where it is in academia, there's certainly a luxury of having that time and that lack of real world consequences to consider things. Each have their place, really. We need people who are exploring things on a theoretical basis. And there's a need for practical implementation where academic concerns need to take second place to more immediate financial practical things. I certainly wouldn't say that one is more important than the other or or more significant. I I just think they both need to be valued for what they are. I'm wondering if you could talk more about the research in terms of what you were looking at. I looked quite specifically at Google and Alexa because they're the most widespread devices in use, at least in the English-speaking Western world. The first thing I needed to do was gain a, an overview and understanding of the technology involved and the potential security problems that it currently has and that it could possibly have in future and also link that to the broader cybersecurity context as well. So really the best part of my first and even second year was, was taken up with that. And then in the second phase of the project, I did more practical experiments and looking at the developer versions of Google Assistant and looking at Alexa skills as well with the, the sort of voice app, the apps for voice devices really um, called skills. And for the Google Assistant, what I did specifically was input nonsense sounds to it. So sounds which don't actually have any meaning attached to them, which all languages have. They have sounds which in the current usage of a language don't actually have any meaning attached to them and see what would happen if I directed that kind of input to Google Assistant and whether that would trigger any unexpected effects. So I was looking specifically for sounds which rhymed with target commands and seeing if I could trick the device into thinking that a nonsense sound was a target command, which did actually work in a couple of instances, which was quite satisfying when it when it really happened. I also tested the human perception of those nonsense sounds to see whether they would detect them as a target command. As it turns out, humans couldn't hear any meaning in those sounds at all. So it opened up a gap between what a human would hear and how a device would interpret it. Often in security, there's a gap between how things are in a system and how they are in the real world. That's the essence of it. That gap between how humans heard the sounds and how they were picked up by Google was a potential security vulnerability, or that's what I argued in my project. Okay, let's talk about you. How have you approached the biggest challenge in your work? Of course, there are lots of technical challenges in trying to write code, getting things to work, things inevitably don't work, having having to redo them when you really feel like you prefer to be at home and asleep. And then there's an immense challenge of, and information overload, I think, and knowing where to stop. You can't realistically know everything there is to know about your subject. On the other hand, you want to know as much as possible to inform it. So that's really challenging. Aside from those, the most challenging thing really has been a bit more personal. Trying to be convinced that what I'm doing will potentially work and potentially be of use. One particularly challenging aspect of that is that when you start anything, any project, I think inevitably your early ideas will appear in retrospect very naive, very romanticized, and you know, frankly, a little bit embarrassing. In order to move beyond them, you really have to be prepared to see that, but also not just stay there and instead move on to eventually finding something that that is a bit more realizable and, and a bit more serious. So that process actually, if I'm honest, more than anything, being convinced that it is worth persevering and then not getting too caught up in your mistakes. That's been the biggest challenge for me, especially in research, where you're not told what to do. You're expected to be exploring something that hasn't been done before. So you really are not going to get it right. Carrying on regardless in research is a really important skill, perhaps even more so than technical understanding or reading papers. Yeah, I, I have to ask now, what was one of those naive early ideas that you had that you ended up moving past? I'm very curious. I was thinking about precisely that. Of the many examples, I remember submitting an early version of my doctoral proposal plan, and it was something to do with 
So for my first degree, as I said, I think I studied Latin and specifically Roman rhetoric. And I had this idea that I was going to somehow link the theories of, of rhetoric in ancient Rome to the security of voice control in the modern day. And that was going to somehow be of some practical use and solve a cybersecurity problem. And, and within six months of actually learning something about cybersecurity, I, I realized that that was very clearly never going to work. But it was the starting point, I suppose, for eventually ending up with something which no doubt I will also look back on in years to come and think, well, okay, knowing what I know now, I, I would have done this differently. You really do have to start somewhere, as I say, not get too caught up in the less than perfect aspects of your earlier work. One of the questions we ask people is, when did you fail at something in the last year and what have you learned? It's perhaps about being open to new ideas and you've got to start somewhere, especially in an academic environment where it can be quite critical. How do you use that? How do you keep going? What does resilience look like? Cybersecurity leveraging Latin is certainly an idea. Then you've got to a very relevant, useful, and impactful idea by the end of your project. It is difficult because, as you say, especially in academia, there's this pressure to be convincing all the time, to sound credible all the time and authoritative. And of course, that's just not realistic. You're constantly learning as you're going along. There's a balance, really, between being open about your mistakes and humble about what you don't know. And at the same time, also having a degree of composure and valuing what you do know and thinking, well, I do know some things and to a certain extent have a responsibility to try and contribute that. It's very much a balance between those two things. You become a little bit too obsessed with your own mistakes. And then on the other hand, you can not see them at all and continue to make them. So it's finding that happy medium between the two. I took part in your experiment. I remember making up nonsense, random words. There was some wordplay involved. What is a target command and how does wordplay fit into that? Because you said people didn't understand the words, but the words were understood by the computer. Yes, so there were actually two parts of the practical experiment. One was the nonsense sounds that I described targeting the audio part of the voice control device. And the second part was more on the understanding of words level and their meaning. We know that most words have multiple meanings depending on the context that they're used in. And we as humans in our native language do that automatically. We barely think about it. We just use words in their correct context with their given meaning and they're understood in that way. It turns out we don't fully understand exactly how we do that and consequently struggle to teach a machine how to do that. In my second experiment that you took part in, Ari, that's what I was trying to demonstrate is that humans could come up with usage of words which meant something completely different to a target command in a given context and feed it to Alexa. And Alexa would pick up on it as that target command because that was what she was programmed to do. One example is the word bank and use that as you know, river bank. I was standing on the river bank. I lost my balance on the bank or something. And we would all understand that we're talking about a river and water. But Alexa, because she doesn't understand about banks being next to water, will pick it up as a command to do something to do with online banking and act accordingly. So think about how you could trick a system into doing something malicious. You could say a sentence using a word in a different context that sounds totally unrelated and trigger a victim system to do a banking transaction. Any other malicious act that you can think of, really, and that you might be able to work into wordplay. Sort of a, to me, a slightly sinister contrast between the, the playfulness of the wordplay and maliciousness that it could be used for. That's so cool. How pervasive do you think this issue actually is amongst voice or speech recognition technologies across multiple platforms? The privacy aspect of it is widespread. I was looking more at control of devices via speech. I think for the moment, maybe in practice, people are more worried about the opposite side of the coin, which is their devices listening to them. Maybe the applications of voice control have been limited because of this issue of it being difficult to control. So you wouldn't want to be controlling, a, for argument's sake, a military robot via voice if you couldn't be sure that whatever you said was actually going to happen or that you weren't going to say one thing and it would do something else. The issue of the security of, of control by voice is more one of limiting of potential. So if we can solve the security, that would also open a number of applications which are currently too risky but might actually be otherwise quite valuable. The other issue relating to voice that's come up and has actually happened in practice is deep fakes. We've had images, but it's also happened with voice where people have been able to do more and more convincing imitations of, of real individuals' voices and use those to trick people. I think someone was actually tricked into making a bank transfer thinking that they were talking to their CEO in another country. 
that kind of use of audio technology is becoming a real security concern. Again, that's slightly to the side of what I was looking at in, in my research, but related. Does that mean that we just shouldn't let recordings of our voice, as we record a podcast, go out onto the internet? Are there safeguards? In the beginning, you described yourself as a researcher hoping to be an innovator. It sounds like you are working in a space that's ripe for innovation and interesting projects. What do you see as the exciting or troublesome parts here? It sounds like there's lots of moving pieces. Well, it's certainly an area that has many problems and as yet perhaps few solutions. I don't think to answer your question about voice recordings, I really don't think the answer either in terms of what we should be doing or in terms of what we can be doing is to just try not to be recorded or try to limit our communication or because that a it's impractical and probably happen anyway regardless and b is restrictive and fear-based we may not know what it is yet but that isn't the answer the answer is to find a way to handle this in a secure way that that is my area of innovation that maybe if you <laughs> look me up in five years time I, I may or may not have solved Speaking of in five years from now, if you had unlimited time, unlimited resources, if you were given anything you your heart desired uh, at your disposal, what would you do with all of those resources? What problem would you fix? I had to think about this question in advance and came up with something which is perhaps even more fanciful than the work I've already been talking about. Earlier this year, when Perseverance landed on Mars. I watched it on NASA TV, partly being at home during COVID, also partly out of interest. One of the things that struck me about it was that when it landed, it almost immediately started sending Twitter updates. Now, I know that that was probably in this instance, a human typing at NASA and not the actual robot on Mars. But having said that, it got me thinking about the fact that going into space, probably, in fact, we already are going to be sending robots ahead of us. Alexa is a robot. And I wondered, well, what would the place be for speech technology in that? Could we train a robot to describe to us the things that it finds? How would we make those communications coming, coming back to us from the robot secure, I suppose? If we do ever encounter anything that's moving on another planet, probably a robot will be there first on our behalf. How would we train it to talk to it? <laughs> so in this kind of dream world where I have unlimited time and unlimited money, I would love to look into that. How would we use speech technology in that kind of context? What, what would that even be? How would it describe a landscape that a human's never seen and then send that description back to us? As I say, very, very sci-fi and, and drifting off into the realms of total fantasy. I feel like that answer could very well be turned into a sci-fi limited series. <gasps> I'd watch that. Yeah, I would too. That's, <laughs> okay, that's, that's the next project then. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's get storyboarding. All right. Have theme music and everything. <laughs> Just be really good. It's so poetic as well. That's a vision for the future. It's almost sensory. We're talking about interacting or, or describing the world around us or getting a robot to do it. Does accessibility come into this conversation? The potential to voice hack or hack Alexas and, and Google Homes and Home Assistants is not just a general issue. It's also very specific for people who use technology in a certain way. I don't know if you encountered anything about accessibility or how this might affect how people interact with technology. Yes, certainly. I mean, coming back to more immediate human and social topics, that, that is something I've thought about moving away perhaps from sci-fi in the future to people's more immediate concerns. Yes, I think voice control has a big part to play in assisting people with mobility issues at home, turning on the light from across a room or turning off a, a kitchen device. The reliability and security of voice control becomes even more important in that context when it's being used by someone who's, who might be entirely reliant on it rather than using it as a convenient option. There are all sorts of endless applications that really become very immediate, very practical and perhaps less romantic in, the, in that setting. Much as I enjoy thinking about the bigger picture and the exciting topics, I do think that this kind of technology also has more immediate, more human, perhaps less glamorous applications that are just as valuable, possibly even more valuable. I haven't worked with home assistants. Is there some bigger push for this or is it something that we don't talk about enough? probably is something that's not talked about enough. It all goes with this general sense that was, when, when Alexa first came in, certainly in Google Home, it, it was more of a toy, um, very trivial thing, something that people ask the weather and get it to play music and almost a bit of a gimmick. And perhaps there wasn't enough thought into these more serious applications, like perhaps because it was not immediately 
attractive to the wider population. There probably is a, a lot of scope for looking at voice control in, the, in that context and improving it, making it more reliable and more genuinely useful. Even to install your smart light bulbs and to connect that all to Alexa and all this, the barrier to entry is actually quite high. My friend has some light bulbs that are smart bulbs and Alexa deals with them and I can't. Alexa doesn't recognise my voice, but recognises his voice. Uh, I've got someone who spent a day trying to install a voice controlled kettle. Yeah, it's... <laughs> I agree with that. That's after four years of doctoral research in the area. Right? <laughs> We're meant to be, we are the experts, people. With respect to accessibility and voice commands, is it your sense that technology developed for vulnerable populations, individuals who have specific disabilities or needs around technology, that security by design is a priority, an afterthought, or not thought of at all? We all know in cybersecurity that well, security has been an afterthought full stop for the whole of the internet, for the whole of these systems that we've put together. And, and that problem just becomes exacerbated when we have these sensitive applications or applications which are used by more vulnerable people. In a nutshell, security tends to be an afterthought rather than something that's baked in from the beginning in system design. There are new security angles to the fact that we can make things happen just by speaking to a device that haven't been explored yet. There are all sorts of implications and security problems to be solved. Really, we've only just scratched the surface. What are your tips for keeping up to speed with cybersecurity? I try to read blogs, specifically Bruce Schneier's, which I think is probably the go-to one for a lot of people. I've subscribed to a few newsletters, one that's being produced by one of our alumni, actually. The other thing I do when I have time is every time there's a cybersecurity story in the news, I try to look into at least some of the background to it. So beyond the headline, try to look up some technical blogs, some technical articles and try to develop some understanding of what actually happened from a more specialist point of view, I suppose. That's quite helpful. Who do you go to for these write-ups? Well, Google tends to throw up CNET and various technical blogs or academic articles. Sometimes I use Wikipedia if I really don't know anything about a specific area. Just some kind of technical material that is beneath the media, if you like. That's a way of continuing to develop in a way that's actually realistic from a time perspective. Join us next week for another fascinating conversation. In the meantime, you can tweet at us at HelloPTNPod. And you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. The title there is PTN Pod. See you next week. Bye. This has been a podcast from the Center for Doctoral Training in Cybersecurity at the University of Oxford, funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council.